All right, Revolution, how are we doing today? Excellent. So glad to be here with you guys today. My name is Corey, and if the flannel button up and the skinny jeans did not give it away, I am the student minister here, which means I have the privilege and joy of pouring into your ever evolving and hormone ridden teenagers. It is fun crazy and very rewarding. I love getting to invest into our students, getting to invest in the next generation, but I do enjoy being down here with you guys occasionally as well. So now that you know who I am, I wanna get to know who you are. So I'm gonna count to three and you're gonna yell out your name. And keep in mind that I am a student minister, which means if you don't do it loud enough, I'll heckle you until you do, okay? Just a part of the job description. Here we go, one, two, three. Excellent, great to meet you, at least most of you. Let me pray for us as we get started. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope and the encouragement and the joy that is found in it. God, I pray that you would bless your word, that you would use it to speak to our hearts, whether we are in a season of joy or a season of weariness. I pray that your word would be a source of satisfaction and a balm to our soul. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this past week, we finished up our Mobilize series and next week we are starting a new series, which means today I really just get to speak whatever is on my heart, which is always an exciting thing for me. So what I wanna do is for today, I wanna look at Romans chapter five. So if you have a Bible, you can look at Romans five. If you got it on your phone, swipe there. Romans five, verses one through six. We'll jump around a little bit outside of that, but that's gonna be the primary text that we're looking at. So I wanna read the whole thing, so all six verses together, so that we can get a framework uh, for the passage, kind of see where we're going, and then we can back up and break it down a little bit. Paul says this, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. For while we were still helpless, At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So in this passage, you really see two central themes. You see the theme of affliction and the theme of hope. In fact, let's say that together. Everyone say affliction. Affliction. Everyone say hope. hope. Now, there are certain doctrines, certain truths in the Bible that go together really well, like peanut butter and jelly. You got faith and works. Makes sense. Grace and truth, peanut butter and jelly. Then there are certain passages like this where it doesn't quite seem like they mix. Affliction and hope, at least on the surface, don't sound like a good combination or at least a sensical combination. Fun fact about me, I really enjoy eating sandwiches. Anyone else in here just a fan of sandwiches or bread in general? Okay, all the hands went up, right? I always love it when people are like, hey, you should try to be gluten-free. And I'm like, hey, I like being happy. So no. (laughs) I like sandwiches a lot. In fact, I could probably rank them for you. You know, you have the chains like Publix is at the top. Uh, You have the, the, you know, local places like R&M, Mary's Bread Basket. And then Subway is like, Like way down here. You know, it's not even exactly on the chart. It's not really a sandwich, it's just trying to be. And so I love sandwiches. I could give you the rankings of all of them. I love bread in general. But here's the thing, when you go to local shops or different places, you know, even just around the country, you'll find that a lot of local shops have really weird sandwiches. They have to have at least one really weird sandwich. And some places just specialize in weird sandwiches. The thought of even going in and getting a normal sandwich is just off limits for them. So this week I was looking up some strange sandwiches and I found a few that I I feel like could edify the body of Christ. Check out this first one. This is a ham, cheese, mayonnaise, and Oreo sandwich. 
And this is odd. I don't know about you, but I have never had a moment in my life where I was eating a container of Oreos and I thought to myself, you know what this is missing? <laughs> Ham. <laughs> Look at this second sandwich. This is creativity at its finest. This is a hot dog, graham cracker, potato salad, syrup sandwich. So if you're pregnant, you get a pass. Baby, that sandwich looks so wonderful. That's so great. I'd love it if you made that for me sometime. Just not right now, I'm kind of full. If you're not pregnant, we have pastoral care available. There are helps, there are truths in scripture you can cling to amidst your struggle. The last one, this is my favorite, the corn pop cheese whiz sandwich. It's actually just a picture of my breakfast. So you look at these sandwiches and you go, that's gross. Well, why? Because the ingredients don't mix. You got corn pops and cheese whiz, that's not supposed to go together. Ham and Oreos aren't supposed to go together. So when we read this passage and we see stuff like hope and affliction, a lot of us get that same feeling. We go, man, this just doesn't seem like it goes together. This doesn't seem like it mixes well. Those two ingredients don't seem to relate. Well, as we read through this and break this down, Paul is going to, in typical fashion, he's gonna flip this thing upside down. He's gonna give us a new lens with which to view these things. And in doing so, he's gonna show us that not only are these two themes central in Romans 5 and our lives, but they can actually be complementary. So let's look back at it, let's break this down a little bit. Verse one, Paul's gonna start by laying a strong foundation for the rest of what he's gonna say. He starts by saying, therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith. So Paul starts with this word therefore, which means he is alluding back to a previous thought, and he is potentially about to break off into a different thought or conclude a thought. So we have to ask ourselves, what is he looking back at? What is he alluding to? Well, sometimes in scripture, you may go back a verse, makes sense. You may go back you know, a paragraph or a passage and it starts to make sense. But I think in Paul's case here, he's actually going back to the beginning of the book of Romans. Because again, we're in chapter five right now. So this is, you know, uh, about a quarter of the way through what Paul is going to talk about. And throughout, if you study it, there are themes that play out in certain parts of the book. So if you look at chapters one through four, you could really sum up those chapters with this phrase, justification by faith. Justification by faith. That's really the main point of what he's saying here. So if you read through the first four chapters, you see God's wrath. You see our unrighteousness in deserving that wrath. And then we see Christ set forth as our righteousness to appease God's wrath, which is what justifies us before a holy God. So he lays out justification or us being declared righteous. And then he's gonna go on to explain the effects of that. He says, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first effect of this justification is peace with God. The Bible tells us that at one point we were enemies with God, that we were hostile towards God. But because Christ has come, the wall of hostility has been knocked down. We are now reconciled to God. We can have peace with God through Christ. So that's the first effect. Then he goes on in verse two and says, we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. So the second result of this justification is access into grace. And I love the way he says it because he says this grace in which we stand and that sounds good to me because it doesn't sound like a kiddie pool grace where you got some grace up to your ankles. This is a grace that you are at all times, wherever you go, standing in, firm in, surrounded by grace. You have accessed grace. Then the last thing he says is, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory 
of God. So we have peace with God, access into grace, and we have hope for glory. Because of what Christ has done, we can look forward to the end and know that we will be in perfect glory with him for all of eternity. This is the massive foundation that Paul is laying. You've been justified by faith. And here's all the results of that justification. But then he goes on and he puts the Oreos on it. See, at this point, Paul has stacked up everything real nice. It makes sense. Peace with God. We got grace. We have glory. This is great. I love what you're saying, Paul. I'm all about it. And then he says this. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions. And again, for all of us, this is where we would go, okay, who put the corn pops on the sandwich? Paul, you were laying it out really nice. I was on board with you. I was tracking with you, Paul. And then you went and said this. And if you read through this for the first time, it's kind of confusing because it, it doesn't, it seems like a little bit of a left turn. We're going, where, where is Paul going with this? That was kind of out of nowhere. Are we sure? Does anyone have another translation? Surely Paul meant like affirmations, right? It didn't mean afflictions, but this is what Paul says. And so the pestering question really for all of us, whether you don't know God at all, so this seems foreign, or whether you have been walking with God for a long time and this still can feel foreign, the pestering question is why? Why would I rejoice in affliction, which that word rejoice means to boast? Why would I boast in affliction? Why would I hope in affliction? Well, I think there's four reasons that we see just in this text. So that's what I wanna look at the rest of today. So if we back up, looking at the foundation that we just laid, we find the first reason for hope in affliction. First reason for hope is this, our affliction cannot be the result of God's abandonment or punishment. Our affliction cannot be the result of God's abandonment or punishment. It is a knee-jerk response, even for very mature Christians. When affliction comes, the questions that plague us or the thoughts that plague us is God must be absent or God must be angry. Because if he wasn't absent, if he wasn't angry, these things wouldn't be happening. So we say things like this. Tragedy strikes, a season of suffering comes, and we go, God, if you were present, you wouldn't have let my financial stability crumble like that. God, if you were near, you would not have let my teenager walk away from the faith. God, if you were near, this affliction wouldn't be. Or maybe you're on the opposite side of the coin. And for you, you go through affliction or suffering and you start taking stock of your moral track record. You get out the checklist where you're going, man, have we, have we been to church enough? Have you been reading your Bible? Have we tithed? Have we done all of these things right? Have we pleased God enough? Because if he was pleased with us, this affliction wouldn't be happening. But if we look at the cross, here's what we see. We see a God who came near by being punished in our place. He came near, put on flesh and bone and was punished for us. So in the middle of affliction and suffering, if you look at the cross, you cannot conclude that God has abandoned you or is punishing you. The punishment that God needed, the, the wrath of God is satisfied. Jesus took the punishment upon himself. God didn't leave any to the side. The punishment is on Christ and God is near to us. It may feel like God's not near. It may feel like God is angry, but rest assured when we look at the scripture, we cannot conclude that that is the case. Now, could the father be disciplining us? Absolutely. Hebrews 12 talks about that. Could he be testing us? Sure. James talks about that. 
but it is not abandonment and it is not punishment. So really our first hope in affliction is in what affliction is not. And we have to lay that before we can go to what it is. Look at verses three and four. And not only that, but we rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. See, what I have found to be true in my life and in many people's lives, pretty much all of us, is that we want the product without the process. And that's the case with our own lives too, with our holiness, with our Christ-likeness. We want the product without the process. This is what I would call instant pot sanctification. This instant pot thing seems to be getting popular right now because crock pots are no longer cool because that requires patience. <laughs> so we get the instant pot. In fact, I'm uh, engaged to be married in February, which is very exciting. Thank you. So me and my fiance went and registered, which was a lot of fun because she registered for all the really important stuff. And I, at one point, registered for a six foot tall abominable snowman. And I was like, listen, babe, if someone gets this, I can't take it back because the fact that they paid $300 for this thing is just impressive. So we went out and registered. And in doing so, one of the things that we registered for was this Instant Pot, which, you know, I don't cook a whole lot. I like going to Panda Express. It's about as close as I get. And so I didn't really know what this thing was. So she was explaining it to me. She's like, oh, it can work as a crock pot or it can like pressure cook something real fast. So what I realized is that no one really buys the Instant Pot to use it as a crock pot. You buy it so that you can pull a chicken out of Mount Everest, covered in snow, dripping with icicles and be like, hey, we're gonna have dinner in 10 minutes. That's why you get the Instant Pot. It's quick and it's easy. And so for a lot of us, we want that for our lives. We want that for our sanctification. As God is changing us, we're like, God, can you just do the quick part of it? Can you make this quick and easy? Because I really don't want to go through all this. God, I want to be like Christ, but the whole, you know, walking to the hill and the cross and all that, I don't know about that. And so we get impatient with this process. And this is something that we cannot settle for when it comes to our faith. Because if we want a true and genuine and tested and firm faith, we have to go through the process. And this is the process that Paul just laid out. Affliction leads to endurance, which leads to character, which leads to hope. So let's break that down a little bit. First part of the process is affliction leads to endurance. The definition of endurance is this, the power of enduring an unpleasant and difficult process or situation without giving way. I think the last part of that definition is the hardest part because when we are going through affliction or suffering, it is very hard not to give way. It's very hard not to give in to despair like the writer of Ecclesiastes talks about. It's hard not to give in to sin. It's hard just not to give up in general. And the reason for that is, is because by definition, this process, although leading to something good, is unpleasant and difficult. See, I enjoy going to the gym. I go to the gym about four times a year. I like exercise, I just don't wanna actually go to the gym. So every once in a while throughout the year, I'll try to get back into you know, lifting weights or whatever. And so I'll go and I'll work out for a couple weeks and then I get busy and so I back off. I'm like, hey, I gotta get stuff done, right? So I try to go back a few times a year and this strange phenomenon happens every time where I work out for the first time in a few months and it's painful. So I wake up the next morning, it feels like I got hit by a train and it's hard to brush my teeth and it should never be hard to brush your teeth. <laughs> like it shouldn't be a difficult process to put deodorant on in the morning and yet I'm like, oh gosh. So I try to go back a few times a year but here's the problem though. The problem is because I don't stick with it long enough, I don't learn endurance. So there's no endurance, there's nothing that builds up that says, hey, the next time this happens, I'm gonna be ready for it. The next time I have to go through this resistance or this affliction, 
I'm gonna be ready for it. And so I haven't learned endurance. And so when it comes to life, we have to know that affliction will happen, whether that's a prolonged season of affliction, whether that's just a big you know, affliction bomb or whether that's just a few things along the way. In all of that, God is creating endurance in us. Well, what's the point of endurance? Endurance leads to character. Now this word character, when you study it in the Greek, is a little bit of a weird word because although it kind of means what we understand it to mean in English as far as a, a moral excellence, it really means more than that. In fact, this same word is translated in different places as test, proof, or even approval. So instead of just taking my definition to it, I'm trying to understand what Paul is saying here, what he's trying to get at. And I think the point he's getting at is that through endurance, you will prove tested, mature, and firm in your faith. So endurance produces a firm and steadfast faith. Look at the way James describes this here in James chapter one. He says, consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So James sounds a lot like Paul. James also likes cheese whiz and corn pops together. Joy and trials. So if we put them together and try to understand this in a total sense, we could say this, let affliction have its full effect. Let the suffering have its full effect. Endure the process for the sake of the product. And in James's words, the product is that we will be mature, complete, and lacking nothing. And I want that. I would love to be mature, complete. I would love to lack nothing in life, to be completely satisfied in Christ, to be completely taken care of. Now, obviously, in our sin, we're always gonna wrestle through this. This process is never gonna end until glory. But as Paul says, he's taking us from glory to glory. So he is maturing us, he is completing us, he is helping us lack nothing. And then he goes on to the last part of the process, which is character leads to hope. So if you zoom out a bit, really what this is saying is affliction leads to hope. Affliction leads to hope. Well, based on what we just talked about and breaking this down, what's the hope? Well, our second source of hope in affliction is this. Our affliction is producing maturity and security. Our affliction is maturing us. It is making us like Christ. It is securing us in his hands, reminding us that we cannot escape the grip of God. It is maturing us and securing us. It is making us like Christ. It is making us better. But in these verses, in this process, there's another source of hope too. The third source of hope is this. Our affliction produces a greater trust in God's future grace. Because there's a sense, if you have been through affliction or a season of suffering or been disciplined in some form or fashion by God, there's a certain amount of trust that is gained and refined as a result of that. Where you can look back and say, you know what, God, I don't want to go through this again, but I saw you pull me through the first time. In fact, there's a song that we sing here. We sing it a lot in students. We sing it up here as well. It's a song called Do It Again by Elevation Worship. And this has been such a good song for me to cling to in the midst of my struggles because again, the song's doing what we just said. It's looking back on God's former faithfulness and it's saying, look, I'm kind of in the middle of it again. I'm kind of in the middle of the process. I'm trying to endure. And so I look back, remembering what you've done so that I can look forward in hope that you will do it again. So in other words, God, I don't wanna go through it again, but in your sovereignty, if you see fit, you will do it again. I don't wanna go through it, God, but you are faithful. I can trust 
to a greater degree that your grace is ahead of me in wherever I land and wherever I go. So there is a great, massive source of hope for us here and now. God has not abandoned us. He is not punishing us. He is securing us, maturing us, helping us trust in his grace. But there's also a great source for, of hope for then as well. I wanna back up to verse two. I kind of glazed over this a little bit at the beginning because I, I thought it was most fitting to do this at the end. But our last source of hope that we see in this verse is this. Our affliction is pointing us to glory. See, Paul, at the beginning, he says, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we have a great hope for here and now, but we also have a great hope for then. This affliction is pointing us to glory. Paul in Romans 8 says it like this. He says, the sufferings of this present time are not even worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. And if I'm honest, there are certain times where I read that passage and I go, God, are you sure? God, are you sure? Because this world can be pretty weighty. We don't even want to turn on the news anymore because we're afraid of what's going to pop up this time. There is so much weight going on. There's weight in our own lives, affliction, suffering. And so we look at this verse and we go, God, are you sure? Are you sure that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing? And here's what I think Paul's doing. I, I, don't, think, I don't think Paul is minimizing the affliction. If anybody knew affliction, it was Paul. Go read through the book of Acts. This guy went through it. This process was grueling. It was tough for him. He knew affliction personally. He knew it well so Paul is not minimizing the affliction. He's not your friend that you talk to about your problems and they're like, well, deal with it. Glory's coming. Paul's not minimizing affliction. You know what he's doing? He is maximizing the glory. He is stretching our view of the glory saying, you don't even know what's coming. He is maximizing this glory. He says, listen, you're going through it. You're going through this process this affliction, this suffering in your family, in your own life. And that's tough, but there is a glory that is coming where there will be no more affliction, no more pain, no more grief. We will dwell with God. Look at the way John describes it in the book of Revelation, getting a vision from God. He says, then I heard a loud voice from the throne Look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. There will be a day where we dwell with God face to face and he will personally wipe away every tear from our eyes and grief and death and these things will be no more. The process here and now will be complete and we will enter a new and joyous process of discovering the eternal God for all of eternity. Glory is coming we will be in eternity where Jesus will be our joy. It says that we won't even need a son because Jesus will be our source of light. There is a glory that is coming. Paul is saying, look, I know your affliction is great. Christian, I know your affliction is great, but your hope is greater. Your hope is greater even then. So weary, burden, affliction-ridden Christian, Take heart. Jesus says he has overcome the world. The writer of Hebrews says it like this. He says, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees. Make straight paths for your feet. 
What's he saying? He's saying, look, I know you're tired. I know your hands hurt. I know you got that spiritual arthritis going on. I know your knees are weak. I know you want to buckle under the weight of life. Don't do it. Don't lose heart. Keep going. The path looks windy. The path looks scary. Make straight paths for your feet. Christian, do not lose heart. There is hope in the middle of our darkest and deepest afflictions. Now at this point, there may be some people in here that go, how can I believe that? How can I trust that that hope is gonna be true? How, how can I trust God here? Well, Paul writes these last couple verses with you in mind. He says, this hope, what we just talked about, this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. There are many disappointing things in life. There are many things in life that can be a letdown. There are many things in life that can be painful. There are things that disappoint us. So you may be asking, how do I know this hope won't disappoint? Well, Paul tells us right here. He says, the love of God has assured it and proven it. Remember, this is post-Calvary. Christ has come, he is risen. So what Paul is saying is, look, this hope will not disappoint us. How do we know that? Because he already proved it on the cross. He says, if you're worried about disappointment, just look back at the cross. That's my reminder. That's my reminder that I will not disappoint you. That's the assurance that if I have done the hardest thing in sending my son for ungodly people, why would I not do everything else? If I've given the most valuable thing ever, why would I not also give you everything you need? This hope will not disappoint our expectations can be as high as the roof and when we get to heaven and see Christ face to face, we're gonna go, man, I had no idea. I had no idea how glorious this would be. These hopes for here and now, our hope for glory will not disappoint because God has proven it through sending his son out of his love for us. So these are the hopes amidst everything else, amidst the letdowns, amidst the frustrations, amidst the disappointments, these are the hopes that we can let sink deeply into our hearts. We can take him to the bank and we can pray that God would fill us with a belief in his future grace and his hope. Let me pray for us. Everyone's heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe for you, you're in here and you're hearing what we're talking about and you're hearing about this process and you're wrestling through it. But maybe for you, you need to back up to the foundation. Maybe you need to back up to the beginning and first acknowledge that only through the work of Christ on the cross and paying the penalty of our sins can we have peace with God, access into grace and hope for glory. So if that's you and you feel like there is a tugging on your heart, you feel like God is drawing you to himself, do not resist that. Lean into God today, trust in him to be your source of salvation. If that's you, I wanna lead you in a prayer. This is not a magical prayer. I'm simply trying to help you with the words to call out to God for the first time. So if that's you and you go, I want to trust in Christ. You can repeat this after me to yourself, not out loud. You can say, dear Lord, I now see my need for salvation. I know that only through the work of Christ can that salvation be possible. 
I trust in you to forgive me, to change me, to carry me all the way into glory. And if that's you, everyone's head still bowed, eyes still closed. If that was you and you you decided to trust Christ for the very first time, I want you to do something for us. We wanna help you in this process. I want you to lift up your hand for us. Just lift up your hand high in the air saying, hey, I have trusted in Christ to be my source of salvation, my source of joy. Just raise that hand up high. We're gonna have response team members walking around with some response bags. In that bag, we have a Bible, a connection card, a couple things that are gonna help you grow in this new and exciting relationship. So keep that up in the air until you get one of those response bags. Now for the rest of us, maybe you've trusted in Christ, but maybe you're going through the struggle right now. Maybe you're going through a season of affliction or suffering or pain. I wanna pray for you too. So if that's you, I want you to lift up your hand. No one looking around, just lift that up and say, you know what, I'm going through it right now. I'm dealing with some stuff. I need, I need prayer, I need the spirit of God to intervene, to fill, to bring grace. Thank you. Let me pray for you as well. God, I ask that you would fill these people that are struggling with your love. God, at the root of everything they're dealing with, I pray that you would remind them that they are loved, that you approve of them, that you are for them, you are with them. And God, I pray whatever they're dealing with, whether it's personal, whether it's family, whether it's job, whether it's outside of that, God, I pray that you would bring grace in the meantime, comfort in the meantime, God, and I pray that you would bring provision and wisdom as they move forward. God, we love you. Again, we are so thankful for the truths and the comforts that are in your word. Blessed as we leave today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man, God is so good. Let's give it up for those that trusted Christ for the first time. That is the best decision you will ever make. Such an exciting thing. We'd love to help you on that journey. As we leave today, per usual, we will have response team members down here, men and women who would love to hear your story, to pray with you. I'll be down here as well if you need to talk, if you need prayer uh, of any kind. And so as we leave, whether we are in a tough season, whether we are in a joyful season, let's leave armed with hope. You're dismissed.